kei ngā mātā puputu, kei ngā mātā tahi o te motu, rarau mai ki te hui. Ko mihi ngā rangi tēnei, e mihi atu nei, kia koutou kato. Welcome to the hui, Māori current affairs for all New Zealanders. E taro ake nei. A community ravaged by past pandemics. I aitua e tahi o ngā tāngata o konei o wharekahi kanei. We look at Te Tai Rāwhiti's race against time to vaccinate 100% of its people. Come summertime, we're going to have a lot of whānau who will rightfully be wanting to come home as they do every year, and many of them won't have been vaccinated. Nationals Dr Shane Riti discusses the latest COVID numbers and his party's response to the outbreak. And the little manu doing the long miles. Those birds are only barely four months old and they've already flown the Pacific from Alaska to New Zealand non-stop. The fact that they're still here is a miracle, considering the loss of habitat. We're in Kaiowa for the return of the kuaka. Tahuti mai. The urgency to accelerate Māori vaccinations amongst our most vulnerable communities has seen Māori health providers trying out different approaches in their attempts to reach a 100% vaccination target. Māori health workers in Te Tai Rāwhiti say they're playing catch-up due to the inequity of the government's prescribed rollout and are looking to the past to tackle the current Delta outbreak. Kaya Rawani Pereira, Tēnei Poata filmed by East Coast cameraman Rangi Rangi Tukunua. The influenza epidemic of 1918 ravaged the country. No area was spared, not even here in Farekaheka, at the top of the East Coast. Mā Tukuho Urupā is testament to the mamai still felt here. Ka hoki ngā mahara ki te mate e rewharewhai. I aitua e tahi o ngā tāngata o konei o wharekahi kanei. Ko e tahi o rātau u kai konei e tāpuke ana. Ko e tahi kai te tahi atu wāhi, kā i mamau atu konei. Māori had a death rate eight times that of Pākehā and amongst the 9,000 casualties were many children. I think those are stories that call to us to think really deeply around, you know, protecting our vulnerable and protecting our whakapapa, protecting our future. Fano here are haunted by the similarities that outbreak has with the COVID pandemic and look to the past to inform their response to this modern health crisis. We saw that what happened was that government spent so much time talking and debating and considering issues that it wasn't mobilising fast enough to protect those who were most vulnerable, and we paid the price for that. And so I think there's definitely some similarities from that situation to this, especially in the context of the Delta variant and the protection of our children here. Almost 50,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been given out in Te Tai Rāwhiti. Marae like this one near Gisborne, set up outside of the normal vaccination clinics in town. The important thing for us was Manaki and making sure that their experience when they came to have a vaccination was a memorable one. Coming here to places that we're comfortable with uh, makes it easy to access information and make a decision to get it if you choose to. Health workers here united in their effort to immunise as many people in the region. Can you explain how DHBs have worked with Māori health providers like yourself and iwi chairs? It's probably the first time we've uh, worked so well together, collectively. And uh, I believe the reason for that is because um, we're all very concerned and we want the best outcome for everyone within Te Rāwhiti. Long are the days gone that uh, people stand alone and work alone, especially when it comes to Māori providers 
impacting or trying very hard to impact alone on Māori health outcomes. When vaccinations first opened to over 65s in July, Māori health providers in Te Tairawhiti adopted a different strategy, one that better suited their whānau living. We didn't roll out in accordance with the tiers because we decided that everyone on the East Coast is vulnerable in some way. You ignored those age groups and you wanted to have an open door policy when it came to whānau accessing vaccinations. Can you explain a little bit about that? Often whānau live uh, with, you know, with more than um, two generations. You know, there's normally grandchildren, parents and um, grandparents living in the one home or very close to each other. So uh, coming from a rural distance, if you're travelling a distance to the local town, to the clinic, then often everyone comes together and so therefore it's much easier for the whole whānau to come in and get their vaccines and uh, receive support and information from your local team of health workers. So we didn't plan to go against the rules of what the government was setting. It was just like you tend to move along and learn with your uh, community as health workers. Tairawhiti has the highest proportion of under 25-year-olds in the country, and it's the 20 to 34 age group that health workers are now focusing on to ramp up immunisation rates. It's about us incentivising a bit more for those hard-to-reach age groups, changing our language to suit what our rangatahi understand. We're not all scientists, and so it's about um, speaking at a grassroots level. The message is simple. To go get your COVID jabs. What do you see as a possible solution of how to reach those people who are still undecided, who still are not trusting of the science? You know, I don't blame people who don't trust the system. I don't trust the system. <laughs> My decisions are not based upon trust in the system. My decisions are based upon the relationships of trust that I have with Māori providers, with Māori experts, with Māori doctors and people who have put in the time to understand what's going on. And also, even when it comes to non-Māori, strong, independent people who have been allies to us. It's much easier, I think, and much faster and more reasonable for us to look to the relationships that we do trust and have the fullness of the discussion there. 90% of Matakawa's komatua have now been vaccinated. And while there's no cases of Delta there so far this outbreak, locals want to keep it that way. Come summertime, come Labor weekend, we're going to have a lot of Fano who will rightfully be wanting to come home as they do every year to Matakawa and many of them won't have been vaccinated. And so we really want to encourage that to be as safe as possible as well for people to normalise getting tested before they get home, for Fano to engage in the conversations to feel safe about getting vaccinated as well. And so, yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done. Iona wā, kā mate rātau, kā mate ngā, ngā tāngata o te marae, kā noho ko ngā tāngata nake, mā rātau e tāpuke ngā tūpāpaku e maumai e ki tēnei wāhau ka tāpuke ki konei. Nā kona kare mohi o tia, kei whea awai, awai, awai. While they can't change history, whānau in this rohi want to learn from it. When we stand at places like our Urupa, filled with children who were never given that choice in the past, I think we owe it to them to have the fullness of the discussion around what this means for us here and now. Narawane Pereira Tera Pūrongo a kuakene ka kōrero au kia tākuta Shane Reti. Next, I speak to National Deputy Leader Dr Shane Reti.
Māori now make up more than 22% of infections in the current Delta outbreak. That's despite being just 16% of the total population. Communities in Northland and Waikato are now on high alert as a tanifa with a long tail prowls their rohe. Meanwhile, Māori vaccination rates still remain worryingly low. National Party Deputy Leader Dr Shane Riti is in Northland where he's helping to vaccinate locals. I spoke to him about the situation on the ground and his own party's COVID response. Tēnā koe e te rangatira, um, e whai wā ki te kōrero kia, kia mātou o te hui. As a Ngāpuhi, a Ngāti hine and a Ngāti wai descendant, how are you feeling about this, this outbreak in the north? Uh, e tūtahi mihi a tēnā koe mō te tonu mai ki a hau ki te tūtaki uh, Good to speak with you. Uh, look, there is a sadness, there is a tension here in the north, but we knew it was coming our way. If it was going to the south of Auckland, it was going to make its way to the north at some time as well. So there is some sense of, of resolve and resolution that that's what's happened here. We had a training run in February, if you recall, just before Waitangi Day. Uh, we went into level three with a case in Northland. And uh, I'm thinking that that was our training run. This is the main game. That was our training run. We've done this before and we can do it again. So there is tension and anxiety. It's very quiet in the middle of Central City Whangarei here this morning. I'm looking out there now. But I have every faith that Napuhi and uh, the rest of Northland can win with this. What's needed? First of all, people need to be tested. And I'm really hoping that we can roll out saliva testing, that we can roll out rapid antigen testing alongside the nosopharyngeal PCR. Secondly, people need to be vaccinated. And we, we can talk about what, what that might look like, particularly for Māori and rural remote communities. And then uh, thirdly, uh, we need to be good with the public health messages, masking, social distancing, staying in the bubble. Those three things will determine how well Northland does with this outbreak, and in turn, how well New Zealand does in the next one, three and five years, socially, economically, will depend on those three factors. What are you hearing there on the ground from, from whānau, from people, you know, how are they feeling? We had a sense that Northland was going to go this way. So before lockdown, I made my way back here, collaborated with the Kia ora I'll be working with. So uh, back on the tools out in the rural and remote areas. I've done that before at Pipiwai when we had the measles project and we just went door to door to door and that's probably what we need to do again. The, you know, very high Māori population in the north to add to the complexity, right? Across Northland, 70% have had their first vaccine, roughly 50% have had their second. Take that back 20% on each of those figures and you get to Māori. So only 50% have had their first vaccine and 30% have had uh, the double vaccine. It's that 20% gap we need to fill up because our at risk across New Zealand and in Northland is uh, Māori under 40. That's our target group. And that's where we need to be doing a really good job here in Northland. But what are you gonna do that others haven't tried already? So uh, if we had the privilege to be helping with policy here today, we'd do several things. If we were to go to primary care, I know as a primary care doctor that I can look at my, my patient list and tell you who's been vaccinated, who hasn't, and who is in that demographic of Māori and under 40. I know where they work. I know where their parents work. I know how to find them. We'd be looking to incentivising primary care, uh, GPs, pharmacists, to go out and do the biggest sequence of home visits they've ever done and actually be at the doorstep, carrying with them the trust and the mantle of mana that they have. Because certainly for a lot of Māori and for others, part of the action that takes them from not persuaded to persuaded is a person of trust giving them information that they can have some confidence in. And the person who's delivered their baby is often a person of trust. So we would have primary care right out on the doorstep doing a range and a sequence of home visits. I don't doubt that you would have success in that, but it would be hard to accept that the Pākehā pharmacist from down the road turning up at a uh, severely de deprived Māori whānau's house would have any success with that. It just hasn't happened so far. So it's a team approach here, and what I found to be successful in my hands, what we did was Pipiwai. It was myself with, with community meeting and community consent. It was, it was myself and a kuya with mana accepted by the community beside me. And in fact, we're already looking to set this up uh, out at, uh, at Whangaruru to Parahuia next week. I will have a kuya with me. And when we knock on the door collectively, we bring the mana of the community and, and the mana of, of my profession. And that's what I found to be successful. You're right. It can't just be, as you say, maybe the non-Maori pharmacist, although uh, they have huge trust as well, just saying, but it needs to have that community person beside it as well. That's what I found to be successful. There's 150,000 Māori in Auckland. Where are you going to find all these queer? 
<laughs> uh, look, we went uh, door to door uh, RD6, and you eat an elephant in small bites, get eating. That's what I say. So this, this is doable. We know that there are, are people in the community who have a wide mandate. So we don't need 150,000 uh, people with mana. Uh, we just need those who will join us, who will stand alongside us and help us go door to door. Just last week, uh, your colleague Simeon Brown uh, slammed the government for a similar approach when they uh, allowed gang members or gang leaders to come into Auckland to knock on doors of uh, some difficult pockets of society. Uh, do you support Simeon's stance? So, uh, yes, I do, but I need to stand beside health professionals, uh, those who bring a, a different level of integrity to this task. And so I believe they can also, we have in the past, they can also reach into those environments. Now, the question would be, there's several things there. Crossing the border, uh, there's an issue there. Uh, was there not enough people of mana and status in Auckland or in that lockdown region that could also help with this? So there's a range of things there. Uh, but well, I clearly actually... Not. Clearly not. And the health workers who are Māori experts in their field couldn't do it without those gang leaders. How are you going to get into these homes? Are you, as a doctor, are you comfortable sending the public health nurse to bang on the mongrel mob pad's door? Uh, she would need, or he or she would need protection around them. This is part of the, the challenge that we have. What does that look like, protection oh, around them? Oh, that looks like the team, exactly like I was saying. We could have a Māori warden. We could have a kuia, kaumatua. Uh, we could and so would, would you be comfortable letting a little old kuia bang on the, the, the mongrel mob's door? If they had a team around them, which may well include police, uh, that team can be very effective and I believe would be respected. Can you actually you know, walk that one through, that you send the police to the mongrel mob's door to get vaccinated? Uh, no, no. What that is, is we send a team uh, to our areas of high risk to encourage them to receive the information that helps them make the right choice. Uh, that, that's what that is. For, for anyone, it's about how do we give you the best information to back you to make the right choice. Yeah. Yeah. That's what this is about. Could even be testing. You know, we can take rapid antigen testing and PCR testing to the doorstep. If they're uncomfortable coming to us, we now need to move the response to them, wherever them is. I guess the thing I'm trying to say here is that the Māori health experts who have been in this field for 20, 30 years now said that they needed to have, you know, the head of that gang member to come and assist them to get through those doors. So with that in mind, would you listen to them? I'll listen to anyone anyone with experience. Uh, but again, I've done this as well uh, out in the rural areas. So I know with my own hands and my own eyes how this works. But of course, we'll listen to anyone with experience who can safely help us get the best response. Of course. A message for Northlanders? Look, uh, Northland, we, we can do this. Uh, I need you to do three things. I need you to please test. Uh, I need you to be vaccinated and I need you to observe the public health measures, masking, social distancing. And if we do that, I am of every belief we will succeed. Um, if we struggle, then all of New Zealand will struggle. And so we have a mandate, not just for ourselves, our iwi hapu whanau, but for all of New Zealand to get this right. And, and I believe we can. Calm hands and composure. We will win with this. O tēnā koe e te rangatira, a e whai wā ki te kōrero ki a mātou te hoi tēnā koe. Ko tākuta Shane Reti tērā. Hei muri i ngā whakatairanga, ka kōrero tātou mo te hokinga mai o te kuaka ki ngā takutai o Aotearoa.
Auraki mai anō. The kuaka or bar-tailed godwit may be small in size, but every year they fly a non-stop 12,000k journey over eight days from Alaska to Aotearoa. To Māori, they are sacred, a holder of knowledge and a carrier of good news. Many kuaka spend the summer in Pukorokoro in the Firth of Thames, a central hub for kuaka conservation and mātauranga. And local iwi Ngāti Pāwa is continuing to drive efforts to ensure the survival of this resilient manu. Anai te pūrongo a John Boynton. For thousands of generations, kuaka have been making epic journeys back to Aotearoa. Ngāti Pāwa Uri Glen Tupuhi says his tūpuna record the summer skies being clouded with manu. In former times, they would blacken the sky. They would block out the sun by, by just lifting off, off the flats. And of course they did cull them. They were a source of protein in a country that's uh, heavily reliant on fish and birds. It was a bird paradise, of course. And so our tupuna did cull the birds and trap them, and there was uh, part of their diet. Glenn grew up in the Hauraki settlement of Kaiowa, where kuaka would flock to the food-rich shorelines after leaving their nest in the great Siberian and Alaskan tundra. What were some of those stories that you heard about kuaka growing up and the significance to Ngāti Pāwa? Oh, hoki mahara ki te wā e, e, e tipu mai ana, e nga wā tai tamariki ana, a kei reira kei a kaiowa, e noho nei kei reira kei te taha toku nei kraua, uh, we walked to school, and, and, and even the generations before us. And the kuaka and, and the godwits, uh, at that time, there were nesting places uh, everywhere. We lived with the birds and the seagulls, many species of seagulls. Uh, the seagulls sat on the ridge of the, of the school, uh, on the top ridge of the roof, and they did their business there, and it got washed into the tanks. And, and we drank the water out of the tanks. So we, we lived in harmony with the birds, whether we liked it or not. Kuaka hold a special place in Te Ao Māori. It's believed their migration helped guide kupe and other navigators to Aotearoa. But today they're under serious threat with the kuaka now endangered across the country. The fact that they're still here is a miracle. Considering the onslaught, considering the loss of habitat, considering the mammalian predators and those rats and mice and possums, and they are prolific killers. The fact that we've still got kuaka is a miracle in itself. That, that shows you about the, the survival instinct of a bird that uh, leaves itself so vulnerable to predation. The Hauraki has changed so much with the silt that's coming off the Hauraki plains as a result of agricultural use, the gold mining, and uh, um, what that does, we have grossly accelerated that concentration of heavy metals that are in the ground and heavy minerals by mining. And of course, eventually it has to be released. And it's being released into uh, Tikapa Moana very slowly, but it's still having a, an accelerated impact on the water quality. And of course, it settles on the flats and that's where the birds feed. That's pretty amazing. They're a tiny little thing, and uh, just to see, uh, to think that they travel that far in such, oh, I guess, all sorts of weathers that they, they battle. Not only has Nazi power been active in its own rohe, Gary Thompson travelled to China, a place where the Kua can make a pit stop on their way to Aotearoa. What was the purpose of you going over there to represent Nazi power? So the, the, the purpose of the, uh, the visit, uh, the trip, was to, to try and influence, I guess, um, the Chinese political systems to, to do something different with some of the areas where the Kuaka and the Huahou stop in Beijing, uh, in Hebei, uh, in the Yellow Sea area, where they've done a lot of commercial uh, activity up there and it's, it's affected the habitat. And so um, our... You know, people down here were starting to notice that the numbers were starting to be to deplete, and the um, the fruits of that hikoi was the fact that the uh, the minister for state forestry administration in China travelled down to New Zealand a year later 
to sign a um, memorandum of agreement to agree to do as much as they can to retain these wetland habitats for, for these birds. That agreement was signed at the Pukorokoro Shorebird Centre, a research and education facility. The Shorebird Centre opened in 1990 and, and Ngāti Pawa you know, did a pulfri and, and blessed the building at the time. So we've had a long-standing uh, partnership, but we're now poised to, to expand on that in a big way, working in genuine partnership with them in terms of management of this coastline. The centre is managed by Keith Woodley, who keeps a close eye on the kuaka. I haven't had a good count today, but we've had, I had a count of 4,000 earlier, and we had about 500 approximately stayed on the Firth uh, Te Kapa Moana over the, over the winter. That's quite normal, mainly immature birds. One kuaka was tracked flying 12,000 kilometres in a non-stop eight-day flight. Uh, getting the individual migration routes of individual birds over two consecutive years is a, is a major advance. And also of note in the birds behind me were, were the nine juveniles that I saw just now. And so the significance of that is those birds um, are only barely four months old and they've already flown the Pacific from Alaska to New Zealand non-stop. So quite an extraordinary story. Kuaka can be found from Te Reringa Wairua to Farewell Spit and are a source of pride for the iwi they live amongst. Would you like to see other iwi have races between different manu? Or? Well, uh, you know, there's some of those birds they return to their to the same nest every uh, every year. And so, uh, for the ones that come back to, uh, I guess, the Paipara, and the ones that go back to the far north, uh, maybe we get to tag a couple there and and have a bit of a, a bit of a race out between uh, the different areas. We could have a competition have a <laughs> against other rohe. You fellas, you you put a tracking device on your bird, and, and we'll see. You. We'll see which one wins and uh, just things like that to raise the, the awareness of the plight of these birds. They, are, they have such a fragile hold on survival. We, we, just, um, we just do not know just uh, how fragile it is. The fragile hold, Glenn says, we can't let slip any further. Whakarongo, 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 ki te tangi at the manu e karanga nei, tui, 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 tui and listen to the cry of the birds. And, uh, and uh, as I heard one eloquent speaker explain it, uh, can we live in harmony with you? Can we, can we coexist? The birds were here first. And, uh, and clearly, mankind is struggling to live in harmony with, with himself, uh, let alone the birds are a casualty. The birds like the Taiao Hekatoa are a casualty of our existence and, and our population growth. Te kuaka mā rangaranga, ko tahi manu i tau ki te tāhuna, tau atu, tau rā. Ko hikina te hui e hoa mā, no hōra mai rā. Zealand on air.